righty guys, so our first call January 2023, which is kind of hard to say, but uh, it's uh, great to have everyone back. And today we are going to be kicking the year off just like uh, the football teams kick off with, uh, they, get, they go back to, to, to training camp and go through the basics. And so I think we're going to do some of that today and really uh, talk about growth and I you know, really want to talk about selling and coming up with a plan um, for 2023. And so I'm going to share a little bit of information, a little recap for the year, as well as some sales tools that I thought you might find of, of use um, as you do your planning for the year. And so when I'm done with this, I'm going to open it up uh, for conversations and, and really uh, I don't have a panel today, and so it's really, it's going to be uh, an open conversation, but I do want to, each of you to kind of talk about your your goals for growth and how you're going to plan the, to hit that. So again, uh, I'll start with the, look, Mark Cuban from Shark Tank Sales Cures All, and I, I've talked to a lot of you guys when sales are great, everyone's happy, when sales are down, bad, the world is a uh, coming down. And so if we can uh, get sales up, then I think that's a good thing for everybody. But not only, you know, sales, you know, also drives profitability. And so I think that's going to be a real focus for us this year. How do you get uh, sales cooking? So if you look at us, um, you know, this is, and this, this is data I, I normally share with the FAC when we, we do our planning. But for the year, gross revenue was up a tad. We were up 11% um, on the net. So I think you, I will, you know, this is, uh, this will be my 16th year this month at Show Homes, which is hard to believe. But I, I would just tell you this, 2022 was a really strange year, just, you know, in general, <laughs> uh, globally, um, but real estate, especially from, just the hottest market we've ever seen to interest rates going through the roof to the market really going what you know some people see a slowdown some people see a total stop so i think you're seeing a normalization but it, it was definitely uh very different and i think it's inventories have been tight and you'll probably see that for a while uh but you know in spite of that we, we've st still you know had a uh decent year to have double digit growth in a, in a difficult year, I think it's still something we should be pleased with. And if you look at the ops report, you'll see people with massive growth. And we also had a few with some massive declines. And so you didn't see a lot of uh, in the middle. You saw one or the other for the most part. But we're hoping we'll get more people with the increases this year. Uh, I, I haven't, we don't have your final PLs in yet into Profit Keeper, but. Um, Advertising, you know, as we, as we take a step, just looking at last year, but also thinking about, you know, 2022, as you start to look at your budgets and your plans, you know, how much should you be spending on advertising? And, and we, we talk a lot about inventory and going to market and this kind of stuff. But, you know, I think a big part of the thing we have to look at is how do we drive more leads for you this year? How are we going to, how are we going to get you know, leads? you know, turn into pr proposals, to contracts, to dollars. And so, you know, you have Frisco, who is a, a brand new location. Uh, but, you know, we go from zero to 46. If you if you look at most uh, home-based service company franchises, they're spending around 2000 a month, around 24000 a year. So, you know, I think we need to take a look at that. And as far as, you know, what should you really be spending? I think we spend a lot... We wouldn't think much about spending 20 grand on inventory in a year, but we don't, you know, thinking of spending that in advertising seems crazy. But um, I did a, for the FAC, I, I took a look just between August and, set, and October of traffic on top and online inquiries um, year to date below. And you can see for the most part, you know, it's pretty basic correlation. The more you spend, the more traffic you have, the more increase you're going to get. And so as you as you look at your plan for the year, you know, I put together this basic marketing budget template that's around 20 grand a year. And really, I think if you take a look at, you know, how do you break this out? You know, I think, you know, 
looking at PR, you know, public relations in general, getting your visibility, trade shows, sponsorships, realtor events. I know John and Aaron and I are on there. He's involved with his chamber. We were in, we played in a golf tournament. He met a lot of people at that thing. He's gotten deals from the chamber, um, you know, trade shows, realtor events. I think all of those are, are great ways to get your name out there. Social, um, Facebook, Instagram, but also LinkedIn. I mean, you can LinkedIn, I think, has a lot of potential. So we don't really look at. And then uh, search engine, um, Google is clearly the big dog in this. And so uh, Adplor is, is a great asset. That's who we recommend that you use. If you want to do it you're on your own, you can try to figure this out. But, you know, having a company do this for you, we think is really important. And just that's something you just want to set it and forget it, so to speak. But, you know, you know you'll update your, your things, your programs and your keywords. But uh, having a marketing budget plan, we think is really important. So next thing I'm going to touch on is your mix of business. And so, you know, we really made a big effort in 2022 to rebrand show homes as show homes home services. And so we have new websites, new marketing materials, et cetera. If you look on the growth side, updates are our biggest um, revenue stream with staging, uh, redesign, home management is was only around 10% of our revenue last year. You know, that'll be one of the things we want to be talking about um, early in the year is as the market really slows, is that you know, we talk about back to the future at conference. Is that something we want to be looking at? Um, it's our most probably one of our most profitable business services that we offer. And is that, you know, I think what's the potential of that look like? Sale of goods. We only had like one or two of you really doing that, but those can be big dollars and then consults. And so this is the net. And so I think that'll be one of the things also to look at is just your margins, you know, across the board, but especially on the updates. You know, if your margins aren't over 25%, 30, you know, most of our competitors, or in the 40 plus range, um, I think you may want to question, does that business make sense for you? Um, but as you look at your plan for the year, are there different revenue streams you want to touch into? And so, um, you know, we rolled into, you know, you just look at all the different things that we offer now. Um, have you gone through the e-design program? I know that there are a number of you have had good luck with that. The interior design, uh, or rather window treatments, uh, we just rolled that program out. You know, they've got margins up to 75%. So, I mean, the profitability of that without inventory is just phenomenal. Um, hey, Matt, when you were talking about the, the update people, what companies are you referring to that have 40% update margins? When you're doing your comparisons, who are you looking at that we're being compared to? Renovation sales is one franchise. Um, there's do, another, how, I'm not familiar with them. How do they how do they operate? How is it that they can get? What is it that they do to get forty percent? Well, it's a little different model. In the fact that the franchisees are the ones who are doing the actual selling, and um, they actually end up doing the work as far as the design. Uh, so they're contract. They're contracting it out. Yeah. They're yeah. contracting it out or they're contractors? Well, no, no. They're finding local contractors. But go ahead. What were you going to say, Bert? Uh, when I visited recently with the CEO of uh, uh, Five Star Brands, uh, he said generally his portfolio of companies uh, was in that uh, 35 to, to 40% profit margin range, gross profit. Uh, and that specifically included five-star painting, which within our system, we've always felt like we were constrained with a uh, much less pricing rate. And he said, Bert, I think you're just underpriced. All of our franchisees contract out 100% of the work to subs and still have that margin. Is 
the five star paint, Serta Pro, budget wines. I mean, so those are in again the renovation sales. I don't know if they're all at 40%. They they may be, I think they go from 25 to 40 is their range. So um again, I think updates and margins, that'll be something we want to talk about this year. And you know, and also I like to bring in you know some contractors who you know who also do this all the time, who could also some bring us some outside expertise, to, you know, as well. So I want to shift gears and just give you some resources and some things to, to consider um, as far as the training and, and things that you can look at. So when, when I started years ago at Shohomes, I brought in a tool called Get Clients Now, which I've used with like four different franchises. And it's a, it's a 28 day program and, you know, you can still do it. We we hired some of their their coaches to do. We bring a bunch of franchisees. They'd have weekly calls and uh, they have assignments. And I mean, it's it's really really productive. But if you just look at sales basics, you know, there's filling the pipeline, and you know, what are you doing as far as you know filling that pipeline, following up sales conversations and closing, and so. You know, there again. I think it's a great book. If you guys want to pick that one up, but marketing strategies. You know, the outreach uh, the most effective is direct contact, networking, referral building. I don't know if I really agree, but I agree with advertising is the least effective. But you know, it is visibility and branding, and then they've got you know an action worksheets, and so. Um, having something and, and really we kind of use some of this to build the marketing checklist so whenever we typically have someone struggling and we look at the marketing checklist it's normally we find that they're focused on other efforts they're understaffed or they're just they're not spending the time and, and hours to get you know to do the you know the basic blocking and tackling that's out there and so but, you know, I think if we may want to take a look at the marketing checklist and see, we want to update this this year. So, you know, how many of you are using the marketing checklist right now regularly? Does anyone use this? No? I, what was that? I saw it. We're trying, Matt. What was that? Yeah, we're, in Frisco, we're trying to, I mean, I've got new, new people, so it's just getting them to get comfortable with, you know, a roadmap like this, but yeah, we're trying to follow it. Okay. We use it in Cobb. I've been using it since day one. Okay, awesome. But still use it. Anyone else use it? We're, <clears throat> excuse me, we're actually bringing it back. Um this this year we have um we've started compiling our target properties list and we have this broken out into our project management tool so that we stay on top of it with all the other tasks that we do so okay well i suggest to all everyone try you know try to use this for 90 days or so and just you know print them out i mean if you want to do it like that you know put it you know put it on your board yeah, if you want to just, uh, if you have a marker, a whiteboard, do that as well. But I mean, we know this works and it's just, you know, and, and part of it could be just, you know, are you, you know, do you have the team to do this? But, you know, are, are you, uh, oh, there's Lynn. Is this in your calendar? You know, one of the books that I'm going to share with you talks about, you need to be spending two, at least two and a half hours a day, um, actively marketing and selling your business so lynn are you with us now i am now hi everyone awesome. welcome lynn welcome welcome so lynn i, I was uh, i was going through this uh, my present my slide deck real quick and uh, i was sharing your favorite thing the marketing checklist so we got a handful who are using it but i was thinking uh suggesting they start the year off kind of going back to this and you want to share your thoughts or feedback on using it? Yeah, well, it's just the basics. And we know after years of experience that it works. And uh, anytime I have a franchisee that says, 
you know, things are just not great right now. We're just not getting the calls. We've had calls for weeks and weeks and now the phone's not ringing. Let's get back to basics. Let's grab that checklist and start it and that'll get your phone ringing again. And um, it's, it's hard to stay consistent because when the phone starts ringing, you have to stop and take care of those callers and those customers. Um, but consistency is key in this and it, it's the basics. So, you know, for the most part, you know, January is typically one of the slower times and we're gearing up for the big season, which starts normally at March, April selling season. And so this is the, the planting season at this point. And so a couple of books I want to share with you. And I know a lot of you guys don't have time to read or you may not be readers, but, you know, you can also find, you know, short versions of these that you can <laughs> read like in 10 minutes, but you can also do audio books. Uh, Chet Holmes, I learned about this book probably, I don't know, eight or nine years ago at a um, staging conference. And so the, the ultimate sales machine and this is one I try to read once a year because it's just it's a phenomenal book. And, you you know, the, the thing you hear about Chet Holmes, who's, you know, really he's, he's he passed away a few years ago. But, you know, he talks about the sales, the demand generation pyramid, how we focus on the three percent who are ready to buy right now. But we don't really focus on the 97 percent that's outside of that who may be open to buying, they're not looking, they may not be in the market, but, you know, create, you know, making yourself a, a, an expert, sharing your information, blogging, you know, advertising, just keep getting your name out there. Just like, you know, back in the day when you were going to buy tires, you never looked in the newspaper, but there were tons of ads. And then all of a sudden you think, maybe I should get a tire discount or whatever. Um, the other one that I just learned about that I guess has been a big thing called the challenger sale. And it really talks about complex sales. I know we, we talk about spin selling and training, but um, you know, the author of that said, this is the most important advancement in, in sales in years. And it talks about, they did a big study looking at top performing salespeople. And what they found is that using this specific sales selling style was way higher than relationship building. And while relationship building is great, at the end of the day, it's about telling a story, using case studies, doing research, using data. I mean, all of that is, you know, you guys have that kind of information. So, uh, you know, we, we've looked at, and I think Barbara's on the line, and Barbara for years has had a spreadsheet showing, you know, her, you know, actual home she staged, their list price, and the actual selling price and the variance and homes that didn't get staged, who didn't use our services and, and what they, they sold for. And she's able to say that, you know, her, her, her home sold for like 97%, uh, non-stage sold for 85% or 90%. Barbara, are you on right now? Yes, I am. Okay, are you still doing this? Oh yeah, oh yeah. You wanna explain it better than I just did? Well, you did a great job. I just, year after year, I just, every time one sells, we just put it on this, uh, into the, you know, and, and it breaks it down year by year as well. And how, how long it's been on the market and how long it was on the market with show homes and the, the, the list price and the sales price. And it's, I can send you a copy of it, but um, okay. it's really effective because it tells a story really fast. Like people get that within 10 seconds when I show it to them. That's awesome. So yeah, I, think, I think that would be good if you uh, send it to us, then we'll, uh, with uh we'll share it uh across the system <laughs> so okay who else, who else uses case studies or data telling a story like that i think pratt i know you guys you want you do a lot of that in houston and you do a lot of blogs you want to kind of explain what you guys do down there um yeah we uh we do essentially the same thing barbara does we just track uh anytime we write a proposal, uh, whether we get the job or not, we track the sale. And that gives us the database of, you know, a big database of comparable homes that we've worked on and those that we didn't. And I just uh, compare and contrast that, you know, 
typically, I used to do it fairly frequently, but there's a lot of data now. So I just kind of do it at the end of each year and uh, publish those numbers in our proposals every year. And it's two simple graphs that show that, you know, we, our home spends significantly less time on market and sell for a higher sale to list price ratio than homes we don't work on. So a uh, couple of simple graphs and easy to understand. And But the main thing you have to do is just get consistent about tracking your data and then spend a little time generating your plots however frequently you want to do it. Yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, I would say our competitors, for the most part, probably aren't doing this as much. And I think this is really powerful. Kind of yeah, it, it is a powerful sales tool, particularly if you got the left brain client that wants to know why should I spend the money. So it's kind of like if I was selling to you and Shelly. So there. Yeah. Well, Shelly's an extreme right brain, so she wouldn't care. But <laughs> oh, I know, but but you you would care. So <laughs> that's more right. than just having a pretty house. So <laughs> what are the benefits? And who else has done something like this? I know, Nancy, you want to share kind of what you guys do up in the Carolinas? Ours is not nearly as, um, as impressive as theirs. We just do um, simple data tracking. Angela does it and shares it in um, different things. When, when we are talking to realtors and they ask for more information, she just shares a, a cluster of homes that are, are relative to that property or a surrounding area. She, she will share data on previous properties that have been staged or not and sold and give them the information that way. But I do like, I do like their ideas. So we will look into that too. Okay. Awesome. So, you know, I think and I, I'm, I'm going to share something that Bert, you're going to tell me I did this wrong, but this is just high level. I did this real fast. So just work with me here, the English major. So I think as you look at the year and you do your planning, you, you, you talk about doing the math backwards. So if you had a goal of a million dollars, let's just, you know, high level, and your average ticket is $2,500, you have some that are bigger, some that are lower, uh, you would need 40 contracts to get a million dollars. So that's 3.3 a month. I, I put in a 40% close rate because that's what I hear from a lot of you guys when, when we look at your close rates. You would need 100 proposals. So how many conversations would you need? You know, we say 5% conversation to proposal rate. So you'd need 2,000 conversations. That's 166 monthly calls. So I think as you start to look at your goals for the year, I mean, what is what is the goal you're going to have and how are you going to get there? And I don't know, has, has anyone ever done this kind of math or this kind of planning to come up with? Matt, yes. Matt, this is Monica. Did you say 2,500 average? Yes. So that's 400 proposal, 400 contracts oh. to get to a million. Okay. Just so we're clear on the math. Okay. Well, I told you I did this real fast. So either way, <laughs> um, I'll update that. So who's? Well, we have we have that spreadsheet, the GPS that does all that backwards for you. You put in your goal and right and all your data, and then it tells you how many calls you need to make. Okay. Matt, I do something like that and I have never reached it, but I, I do set my goal as being a million. And then that does come out to my, my goal is about 40 stages, but then I also have built in there other, other services, like how many home updates do I anticipate and would I like to strive for being my goal for the year and, and how many interior design jobs. So it's a helpful exercise to be able to say, take a look at each revenue stream and break it down by, by what the goal is for each of those revenue streams. Okay, that's awesome. So who's got, you know, it really, you know, as you look at this, what's your goal for, you know, what's your plan to hit that goal? And what, what are your action steps? So does anyone want to kind of walk us through your 2023 goal, your plans, your actions? How are you going to get there? 
Has anyone done this exercise yet? Well, I can talk about that. It's it's similar to what I was just saying. Um, my goal is a million dollars in sales. Um, I, I don't have it in front of me, but that comes down to about one staging a week. So four in a month. Um, I have revenue goals and I also have interior designers that I'm planning to assign to be responsible for, for um, revenue, uh, monthly revenue goals. And so I've started them at $10,000 a month as a revenue goal. And that's, that's a starting point. That's certainly not where I would expect them to be as they um, increase their, their um, skills and abilities and ability to get jobs. Um, and then uh, the action plan that I have now in January when things are so incredibly slow is the, the marketing checklist. And, and that's to uh, book myself into real estate offices and uh, do presentations. I'm also qualified as, a, as an instructor to do the CE classes for real estate, uh, um, real estate agents. And so I've got a goal for myself to do at least one, one class a month throughout the year. Okay, awesome. All right, I'm going to go through the list. So Pratt, how about you? What are your goals and action items for the year? Okay, our, our kind of our primary goal is not so much to increase gross revenue, but increase profitability. Because we're doing, um, on average, about uh, 12 stagings a month, 12 vacant stagings. So we uh, want to increase profitability and our capability to handle that appropriately. So um, the what we have, what we did at the start of December was hire a, a guy of our our guy we call him, who <laughs> internally we're going to start doing all of our moves, and we've already seen a big decrease in our moving cost to uh, related to that, having him be internal. At the moment, we're just renting a truck as we need it, but you know, the plan would be to probably, you know, watch the expenditures for a few months and then probably purchase one and maybe hire a second guy, um, which would be, you know, so I guess that kind of covers our action forward. We've already started on it. Um, I also anticipate that's that that's going to give us the capability to, to do more vacant stagings as well. So uh, yeah. that's kind of where we're rolling along there. But like like I say, at, with our current staffing, I don't really want more jobs yet, but that may come here a little in at, by the end of Q1. Okay, great. All right, John, how about you? What are your goals, plans, and actions for 2023? Um, well, we're just a year old, so we did right at $100,000 this last year, and 75% of that was in the last four months of the year. So um, uh, we have some momentum. Um, our goal for this year is to be 350, which is, a, you know, a uh, significant um, jump from where we are. But uh, again, I think our, we did 20 stagings this year. So if you look just from a easy math standpoint, that's $5,000 a deal. So in order to hit my number, we're going to have to do 70 or, you know, 50 plus updates or whatever. Um, but uh, we have uh, the the people in place, we have the um, all of the inventory, we've got people trained now, we've got um, good relationships with, with movers, et cetera. So um, we're excited about uh, our ability to achieve that. And I'd like to do a million, but uh, we got to walk before we run. So, um, but I think we're going to get there. No problem. Awesome. Good deal. All right, so Monica and Allie, I don't think you guys are together, correct? We are not, but I'm going to let Allie answer. Okay, Allie? 
Um, so we kind of looked over um, everything that has been profit keeper and um, also when we were doing our Christmas list for the year, we looked through to see kind of who our top agents were. Um, we have about five agents that bring us over a half a million dollars of business. So we really obviously want to make sure that we keep those relationships really strong. Um, I would also like to get another three to four agents that could bring us between 50 and 75,000 a year in staging revenue. I think that would really um, kind of bump us up into the next tier of things. Um, also, when we were looking at Profit Keeper, we realized, you know, what we were spending a lot of money on and um, one of them being labor, which we don't really think we can change too much, but the other was we did invest a lot of money in inventory last year. So we're going to try and keep our spending a little bit lower this year, even, uh, even though we'd like to add more agents to our, to our list, um, just trying to be, you know, utilize our inventory better. Okay. Awesome. So what's, what's the number? What's your, what's your revenue number? Um, I mean, we were honestly okay with where we were last year. We ended up just under 700,000 net. Um, I'd like to get to 750 or higher. I would okay. be happy with that. Yeah, awesome. Good deal. All righty. So Catherine, you're back. All right. So how, how about you? What are your goals, plans, and actions? Um, EPA. Yeah. So I've been trying to get time to sit down and break it all out and have the thing, you know, the plan in place. Um, and we've just been there's just been so much going on. It's kind of weird. Um, but um, I have hiring plans. Um, my goal is to hire a full-time salesperson so that I'm not doing it anymore. Um, so that's for the whole year. I mean, I don't expect that to happen right away, but further into the year. Um, and my revenue goal loosely is um, $100,000 more than we did in 2022. So we want to keep the trend going. We did that from 2021 to 2022. We want to do the same thing again in 2023. So uh, that takes us to like 435 or something like that. Okay, awesome. Um, but I need to break that out. Um, and, you know, we've talked about additional home manager contracts. We have a couple now coming down the pike. And so, yeah, big, big, awesome. big plans. Good deal. All right, Yasmin in Denver, how about you? What are your goals, plans, and actions for 2023? Well, I already started with um, the beginning of the year sharing the VA with uh, Sylvia. And um, my focus with, with this new VA was to revamp all my marketing um marketing kit basically. So I'm redoing all the brochures, all the new business cards, everything. It's a, it's a brand new presentation. So my goal is to start setting um, office visits again, which I never did because when I opened, it was just Zoom meetings and, um, and it was working, but now I'm going back to that and I'm going to go and like Ali say, you know, keep my five my five good realtors that are, have given me most of the business of the year, but also add like another five like those that can give me between, you know, 30, 50,000 a year in staging. And also want to educate a lot more on the home manager um, program to the realtors so they understand that when the opportunity comes, they can work with me with the with the homeowner with this program. So that's what I have right now. And hiring, I mean, just with the VA, it's been a lot of help. Um, and then um, we'll continue to do the same, you know, continue back to the business development checklist as well. I've been doing that because it's it, it, like you all say, it works. We all leave it behind when we start getting the calls, but when, we, when the phone doesn't ring for a month, um, you realize that you got to get back there again and, 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 and the, the business is there. We just got to go back and get it. Yep, I agree. Sounds good. All right. Yeah. So 
Lisa Gulliver, are you on? I see you. You're muted. Hi, good morning. You your other half with us. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah, we're both we're both here. Hello, good morning. Hey guys, welcome. Happy New Year. Yeah, you too. Um, so our goal for this year is 1.4 million. Nice. Um, we're in the process of doing exactly what you showed, Matt, the working backwards. We have two um, employees that we've elevated to sales positions and uh, spent a good part of the last two months with our VA creating uh, tools for them so that they can be more autonomous and not have as much oversight from Chris and I um, on each deal that they're working on. So I think that that's really going to uh, really help us this year, uh, you know, with, with them working one full-time in sales and one, uh, one is a lead designer. So she'll be doing uh, sales part-time and design part-time. Um, last year, we, uh, for the first time, used the QuickBooks budget tool, and that was very effective to help us track sales against actuals and our goals against actuals and also our expense goals, trying to reduce our expenses. So um, we have our final meeting on Friday with our accountant slash business coach to load 2023 into QuickBooks to start uh, being able to track that. So um, one uh, of the keys of that uh, is to help us not only track our sales, but also uh, track our expenses because we, we not only have revenue goals, but we have expense goals. Yeah. Do you have, well, do you have that like on your system right now you could show us? I don't, I'm, I don't think um, we could show you the, let's see, I'm wondering if we can show you the last year since we don't have this year's loaded yet. Yeah, either way, I think that uh, might be, let me make you the co-host. Are you guys okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Just a comment while they're bringing that up. Um, in the QuickBooks Online, you have the option to, you know, with a customer, you create a project right. and um, the project reporting in QuickBooks, I use all the time because <clears throat> it's really nice to get a, a good, easy breakout of how much you've made on the project and how much you've spent. And it also gives you the categorization of each. Oh, okay. it, That's cool. it does not include like overhead costs really, but it does include all the direct project costs and that's very helpful. Yeah. Um, what do I do, Matt, to Good. share? Just go here, hang on. I think I gave you presenter rights. So I think you just have to, oh, I stopped my share, okay. Okay, okay, here we go. Got my IT manager here next to me, walking okay. me through this. Um, so this was 2022's, um, so it'll show the actual against the budget, how much you're over or under the budget and the percentage of the budget. Um, and, you know, and you can also, you know, do it by quarter or, or, you know, however you want to look at the data. Um, I'd like to show you what, um, uh, Pratt's talking about, cause we've been using this pretty extensively. Um, so we and this this takes some time to really figure out and set up so that we can pull it into a spreadsheet that we're tracking uh, costs on each project. And then we've we've created a way to spread overhead through uh, against each job. Um, and and we're we're almost finished with it. But this basically will show you all the projects you can do in progress or you can do all statuses. So um, if you do all statuses, we dump this into a spreadsheet, but some of the older ones that don't have a start date and an end date are kind of difficult to, um, to really uh, deal with a lot of the data. So um, down towards if, let me scroll down here really quick. So can you tell us which are up, you know, which are updates, which are stagings, just so we can have an idea. I'm just curious looking at the margin, which is sure. where. Yeah, so this is just an example here, um, uh, start date, end date of this one, you know, in 2022 that the project's completed. Um, right here, 
uh, it shows that it's an OOP, which is a restyle and it's out of territory. Um, and then here we have an OOP that's in territory, um, but we have, uh, if it's a v, if it's a vacant, it'll say VAC. If it's an update, it'll say UPD. So we we name our projects based on the type, yeah, code based on the type of project it is. So that way, when we import the data, we can easily sort uh, sort everything and look at margins based on whether it's a vacant or a restyle or or updates. Um, did you want to show them something yeah. here? Yeah, I was going to so. So if you go into a, a job, let's let's just let's just sort uh, search on. Uh, yeah. Right. This is an update. So if you go into a job, you have these. Um, so here's here's a profit margin. Again, this doesn't include um, o o uh, overhead, but, but it this doesn't is, does include all of the salaries. Yeah. So like hours. It all the hours so that were worked. If on. you go into project reports and then a you can do a PNL on a specific project. I think this is what Pratt was getting to, and this is what we do. So here you can see the income from the job. This is an update, so we have the costs. So here's our profit, and then here's our um, hourly, uh, you know, time that we spent that our, our staff has spent on this, and there's the net income. So um, you know, gives you a, a good idea of what your profitability is by job. So then, so then what we do is we pull this into um, a report that our of that our um, uh, that our VA has helped me create. Let me just get here to. Did your VA have QuickBooks experience? Uh, no, no QuickBooks experience, but he's he learned. he's learned it. Yeah. Yeah, he learned it. Uh, the basics that we needed him to, but he's he's a whiz on uh, spreadsheets, which is uh, kind of real help doing these kinds of of analysis for us. So this is this is basically all the 2022 projects, and you know obviously we can sort them you know by the type of project, um, you know whether they're home manager, OOP, VAC, or updates. It shows the income, the cost, the royalties, the out of territory fees. Uh, and then the overhead distribution is basically where we take the total amount of overhead that's not assigned to the project. So that's anything that's not payroll on the project, not moving on the mover, you know, paying movers on the project. Um, so all the other stuff like organizing the warehouse and I'm, you know, uh, you know, just, you know, all the projects at the warehouse and, sales and marketing and all that kind of stuff goes into an overhead number on your PL. So we just pull that out and then we distribute it based on the, um, we're distributing it based on the amount of furniture in the property. Just tell me, Matt, if you want me to be quiet because I'm thinking- I think everyone's here. enjoying this, correct? I don't know. This. Sorry. It's useful? Okay, so, go ahead. So we figured out that if we, if we look at the amount of furniture used in a house, the dollars used in a house that, um, you know, that pretty much is a, is an equal, you know, uh, uh, value to the amount of time spent in the house and the amount of warehouse space needed and the amount of, you know, cell phone activity and the amount of everything re kind of revolves around how much furniture you're putting in the house and how, and all your costs of furniture, costs of furniture is all in our overhead number as well. So then we distribute it out and, um, and then we get like an actual profit mar margin. As you can see, our mar our margins, uh, once we distribute all that overhead, do not look that great because we had an imbalance last year between our overhead costs, primarily our warehouse, and the amount of revenue we, we attained for the year. So we were w way under what we needed to be last year for all of our costs and so anyways, that's what we're working on this year is to get positive numbers into every category. Um, updates are always positive because no money goes into, no furniture goes into updates. Mm -hmm. um, basically, when you look at an update, the, if, you, if you have the payroll hours in your update, you know, everything else is, is gravy because, I mean, we, we add obviously royalties to that and we, and we add a little bit of 
um, overhead for, you know, paying this, you know, cell phones and utilities and all that kind of stuff, but it's not much. So, um, so that's kind of how we're breaking it out. But so, Lisa, on this job that you have up here, you said this one is a, this was an update, or excuse me, this was a occupied staging. What is? The one that's on the screen right now. You just haven't been seeing the screen. Oh, the you aren't looking at this? Why? I Are you seeing the spreadsheet with the red on no. it? No. No, all I see is show home San Diego project profitability. Oh, for okay. So how do I? In care of court. You, you have to share your screen. And okay. You Sorry, I'm talking about this other spreadsheet here. Hang on. There we go. Yeah. Uh, but to answer your question, Robbie, that one is, what, what was that one? That's an update. That was an update. Okay. So on your on your update, your margin was, was a you had a 37% gross margin on that job. And then you end up have to take. We did. I can't see it. Yeah. I don't know why our screen on that particular okay. job. Well, you have to stop sharing and share again. On you have to click on the spreadsheet and share share screen. No, you don't get it. I'm sorry, it, but okay. I'm trying to answer it. Robbie's. Quite, we were on that. Okay. So yes, this this was an update. So there's our our update costs. Okay. And this is our this is this was our our own staff um you know costs. Costs are good. So when you finished up, you you, you had 13, yeah, you had 13 four out of a forty five thousand dollars job. Yeah. Net retail. Or net retail. Okay, do the stop share and go. Let's so, let me show you that one spreadsheet I was talking about real quick here. That's this one. Yeah. So this is what I was talking about, the spreadsheet that we put all the projects into and we can sort by the type of job or alphabetically or whatever. And it shows income costs, royalties, out of territory fees, and then the overhead distribution based on the furniture uh, values of the, of the houses. Um, and, uh, and so let me get rid of this here. So, you know, you can see in the profit margins, what I was talking about, see the updates, the updates aren't burdened by the amount of furniture that you own and the warehouse that you keep and all that sort of thing. So we don't overly burden our updates and all of the costs are in within the job uh, because the whoever's working on the updates, uh, you know, puts their hours into QuickTime and it downloads into this, uh, into QuickBooks. So, um, but profit margins on everything else was low, uh, mostly low, because once you burden everything with overhead, um, if you don't, you know, have enough revenue, you know, the name of the game is the more revenue, obviously, then the, the thinner that the overhead gets distributed and the more profitable you become on each job. But we're looking at what is our minimum that we have to book each month in order to break even and then where where you need to go to, to become more profitable uh, from there. So we we do things a little differently because we have our furniture uh, as an expense. When we buy furniture, it's an expense. So every project, you know, we spread that out. And so every project gets burdened by the cost of the furniture for the year as well, which to me is an easier way to look at really truly how profitable you are in a year. So um, we don't, you know, um, so anyways, what? Hey, Lisa, um, while you've got that up, just out of interest, sort by profit margin, largest to smallest. It's right there on your screen. So I have a question for Chris while you're doing that. Um, if you know your break even, I mean, that that's a metric. I think that's important for everyone to understand about their own business. What changes did you make once you figured out like for instance for show homes mainline we know we have to do four stages a week in order to break all of our minimums so what did you do differently if anything well we're getting a, a, a little more detailed though it's like you know yeah you can we our our goal is always to do four stagings a week but it depends on whether they're restyles or whether they're vacants it depends on you know uh how much we had to discount to get the job you know because we were up against other stagers or if it's a repeat repeat business obviously our margins are better so it's you know that's a really good first step but you have to really dig into um 
you know, what your profit is on every job and what your overhead is at the time. So if you, if your stagings are, you know, 2,500 versus 4,000, you know, then it's going to make a big difference in your break even. And Lisa, before you got shot on, one of the questions, that, one of the comments we were talking about, uh, Matt had mentioned that some of these other comparative home services, five-star painting and some other stuff, were getting like 40% margins on updates. And I'm looking at, at y'all stuff the way you had it done for last year. And it looks like most of your updates were most of, well, the ones you can scroll through, most of them were below that 40% margin. Is that, would that be accurate? Yeah. I mean, we're, we, we try to get 30% on updates and, in, and typically then we are a little bit lower than that, unless we've got a, unless it involves a lot of carpet, because we always make really good money on carpet. So that kind of, that kind of determines whether we're over 30 or under 30, frankly, um, because, you know, and, and every job's different, uh, you know, whether, you know, you, your painters are busy, they're quoting high. If they're not so busy, they're quoting low and you can make more money on them. So, um, but that's our goal is always to, to shoot for 30% because, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to get a whole lot more than that. But well, yeah, pro profit margin on updates is, is, it varies widely, as you know, I mean, a profit margin on lighting and, you know, window coverings, it, it, there's very high margin in those. Uh, but when you talk about, uh, labor services, plumbing, paint, uh, electrical, you know, those are very, you know, and any other subcontractors with labor, they're very expensive. So, so the margins are a lot less uh, when you're using those services. So, uh, it, you know, it, it all averages out, but when you add those services, it, it, it uh, takes a lot out of the profit margin mm -hmm. uh, in, in an overall update job for us. So do you plan on getting into areas like the window coverings this year or areas that are higher margin? Um, well, for, for, uh, for interior design, for sure. But, um, you know, it's, it's hard to, to, to justify doing window treatments on vacant houses for sale because we, we're usually taking the tr window treatments down and, and I, I don't feel like that's a good recommendation to make for people that are selling their home. Okay. So what questions you the guys other, have? A lot of good so I have one other comment, anecdotal comment, if you can hear me. Okay. I'm on the road, yep. but that five-star painting, I mean, I have them in my, in my um, area. So for my personal home, I bid, I had them come and bid a job for me and I compared it to what my painter uh, bid for the job. And I mean, it wasn't even in the realm. So we're talking the bid from five-star was less than half what the bid from my guy was. So for me, I actually went with my went with five star because it was exterior work and that's fine if they're, you know, messy or whatever, it was fine by me. But I would tell you now living through both, you know, sort of people, like that five star painting, their demographic doesn't overlay with our demographic. Like I would never put that five star painter that came in front of any of my luxury clients, whether they're buying or selling the home. It just what wouldn't be consistent with our branding. So that's another thing that I worry about in terms of this whole margin discussion, because we do pay more for our contractors. And there's a reason for that, at least in Philadelphia. And that is they're consistently on time, dependable, clean cut, you know, they're just somebody we're comfortable putting in front of the client. Um, and I would worry about going and seeking out the least cost contractor for the reasons that they're not the most cost. It's because they're not very good or they're not very consistent or they're not dependable or they're not great representation of the brand. Those are the things that that's my anecdotal feedback on this whole issue with regard to painters and margins. Well, and that's sort of been what I've looked at. When we take a look at what happens in Asheville, excuse me, obviously we're able to do some things differently in, in the actual market than we do in the try-in market. But just in Monica's example, you know, five-star was 50% less than her painter would have been 
And then if she would have done that job, she would have had to put margin for herself on that, which, you know, when, when we've looked at some of this stuff, we end up not getting a bunch of jobs because right now in, you know, in a little more difficult time, in the triad, people are looking at the, from that, on their own budgets from that standpoint. And we put our quotes in and we, in 2022, we didn't get a lot of things that we went after because the deal was if we couldn't make some degree of a margin up off of it, we wouldn't do it. But just when we put it out there, they would just tell us, man, y'all are way too high. Um, so we tried to find ways to, to do the checking like Monica had said, and it was, you know, as everybody saw in the option report, it's just, it, it was a tough, tough year um, and stagings, you know, Stagings are, have been difficult as well. So our profit margins in the past have always been able to be supplemented by what we could do with our updates. And in the winston salem market, that's that's been tough. Our, our we've just had to squeeze margins just to get it, um, and it's been hard. So I didn't put a question for you guys saying who's using the QuickBooks budgeting tool. So if you haven't voted. If you could do that. So it sounds like, uh, but those, so who else uses it besides Chris and Lisa? If you mean projects, we use that. I okay. think the budgeting tool is their thing, right? Well, I think, well, I think they have a budgeting tool in it. Yeah. I yeah. mean, if you, if you yeah. looked at it. Quick, QuickBooks has a, has a budgeting tool that you can use. The, huh. the spreadsheet was 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 different because uh, that added overhead, but QuickBooks does have a budgeting tool. That was the oh. first spreadsheet that we show, showed Catherine was the was from actually from QuickBooks, the one that showed the uh, actual the budget and the percentage over or under budget. Right. That was from QuickBooks. Yeah, what's cool about that, it, it, it brings in all your actual costs and so it'll show you your budget, actual the variance. So I think if you're not using that, that may be something to consider. I mean, I know Chris and Lisa, you're you're pretty tech savvy, but was that very difficult to put together? Yeah. We can't we can't take credit for that at all. Um, the that's our accountant and business coach that you know we tell her what the numbers need to be, and then she loads it into QuickBooks for us, and then we have a monthly uh, Big Rocks meeting where we uh, go over the budget to actuals. So. Um, yeah, so I'd recommend you know your your QuickBooks accountant to help you with that. Don't 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 attempt to do it yourself. <laughs> don't uh, it it's just a lot of it's a it's a lot of back end data, but it has basically your entire P and L, uh, but in a budget form, you know, and you can you can you can put in you know you know basically pro forma or estimated you know revenue and expenses for the year. Pratt, have you ever tried that? Because I I'm. Sorry, on the QuickBooks budgeting, you mean? Yeah. Um, actually, I, I, I was looking at that. Be, I was interested in seeing what you did because uh, I've been looking at that. Right now, I currently keep my budget in an external spreadsheet, and mm -hmm. then I just export my P&L numbers from QuickBooks and to do my monthly you know, KPI numbers. But, yes, I don't know actually how difficult it is for somebody to do themselves, Matt, since we've never tried it. Yeah, uh, we can. We've got our call on Friday. I can ask her, okay. uh, you know, if if that really needs to be at the accountant level or if people can figure out how to do that. Themselves. Well, I'm sure that, yeah. you know, if you if you have a, you know, basically, I just use my my P&L categories mm -hmm. to build out my budget for every mm -hmm. year based on the prior year. That's what we did. And uh I'm sure I could figure out how to get that into QuickBooks and see those reports internally because that it, um, you know, it did, it only takes me a, a couple of hours to do it every, at the end of every month. Um, but, you know, I'd probably spend a, a day and a half trying to figure out QuickBooks. So it, but it'd probably pay off within a year on my, yeah. my personal time. Yeah. All right. Well, that, I think, uh, We'll have to share more about that because I think that could be something everyone probably should be doing. And uh, we can, well, so maybe we can see if Jamie Lynn and the other people who do accounting could help us with that. So I'll make a note. All right, let's get back to the goals, plans, and actions for the 23. So, 
Sylvia, Dr. G, are you on with us? You want to share your plans in Hotlanta? Sylvia, well, she may be away. Uh, how about Renee? How about you in Northville? Can you hear me? I can. Sorry, I'm just like coming in from my car. I was driving, so I'm not organized. Oh, okay. Back moment. <laughs> um, so, I don't have things like totally in front of me, but I mean, I have a lot because I think we have a lot of work to do here. So, I mean, overall staffing, sales, profitability, um, just more networking, increasing our realtors. So, I mean, just somebody said too from their um, comment when they did their Christmas gifts, they had five. I think we're probably at nine. Um, so we're just trying to do more networking, getting in front of people, office visits. Um, I need to work on my inventory, like warehouse stuff. Still struggling on that to, to find one. Um, so, I mean, kind of every category is kind of my goal at the moment. <laughs> so what's your revenue goal for the year? You know, I don't know. Um, hold on. I have it here. Is it wrong that I don't know off the top of my head right now? <laughs> yes, it is, actually. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I know it is. I'm sure it is. No, no, no. Um, we're kind yeah. of going through it too. Like we had a lot of updates, so it, they're kind of skewed. And this year is probably going to change at the moment just because I lost my contractor. Well, I let him go. So I'm back to a starting point of finding a new one. So that number is going to be a lot less probably for a little bit. Um, I don't know my overall number. I, I don't know my yeah, that's fine. Yet. No, that's fine. I was just curious. So, okay. Well, you've got lots going on. Um, so Nancy, Robbie, how about you guys? I know you've got two locations. You want to go through your goals, plans, and actions up in Asheville and the Triad? Well, you know, we did, you know, we had, we had a, a you know, based on the numbers I got in front of me, I think we did about 750 something uh, in Asheville, but we only did about 400,000 in, in Triad. It was pretty abysmal. In the next, you know, the, the margin contributions weren't too, too terribly bad on the surface. Overhead is a, is a real issue for what we have. Obviously, we've got two separate warehouses and all the expenses that go with two separate warehouses. So that's created quite a, quite a challenge from us from that standpoint. Uh, so trying to figure out where we're going to be, if, if I can, if we can figure out how to do some overhead, um, up front, that's probably going to be the, the primary thing. It's we'll just, you know, I think we have five page council states right now in Triad. You know, you go back and look at what we were doing before, and we would have, you know, north of 20 or 22 stage almost, you know, almost every every week uh, or month. And that's sort of where we got to be. We did our math the same way to make our numbers work. We need to be doing four stages a week. And then we need to have reasonable margins in the other things that we do. Now, the good news is I got a crap pot full of furniture. So if, if anybody like to buy some, I'll be happy to sell you some right now. Um, but if we could get some staging going uh, in the triad, that would be a, a plus. I mean, that's really the, the biggest issue that we have is we've got to get over that. So if we could get to the same, if we could do you know, a million or a million two in, in total revenue, or if we could get to a million in in Asheville and you know just get back up to five hundred thousand in Winston Salem, but find a way to reduce the reduce the cost. Those are our primary targets where we are. You know, last we let some people go um, in Winston Salem this year to try to reduce some of those costs. And you just get to a certain point. There's you, you get to a point where you can't take any more costs out. So back to what you said at the beginning. Uh, Cuban's comment: We got to have, we've got to generate some more sales uh, with with the better margins. It scares me about the updates. I don't really know um, how to do that. You know, I don't know how to get. I don't. I don't know how to get forty percent more. Um, you know, unless I'm painting it myself, I, I just don't see us that we're able to get those kind of margins doing those kinds of things, especially in the same. So, you know, I've read some of the emails and things that you've sent, the conversation with that. 
And so I'm struggling to try to figure out how to make that work. I'm, I'm at a loss right now. I really don't okay. know how to make it work. So Asheville is on fire and still doing really well, correct? Yeah, we we need a we really need a, another contractor. We're busy, you know, we're busy. Um, but we're we had to change from the guy that we had when we had Jack. Uh, Jack presented a lot better. Uh, Daniel, the great guy, works very hard, uh, but doesn't have the same kind of contacts and support uh, subs that, that Jack had. So we didn't get a couple of jobs uh, that we'd like to have had because of that, because the people really like Jack. Um, no disrespect for Daniel, he's Hispanic, his English is not always great. You have to work at it, and we do because he's a good guy and does good work. But in some of the things we do up there, we miss, we end up, we miss the boat for, for where we need to be. Um, but some of the people that we've interviewed are, are just like what we said. They're going to make their margin. And then if we try to put a margin on top of that for what we do, well, now we've created a dilemma that we don't get the job because they're already high. And we have to make some money or it doesn't work. So, you know, and that's going to change with the new, you know, with the new royalty system, which makes it more complicated. I, I haven't I haven't completely worked through all of that math yet based on just trying to get the jobs that we had done. Um, but it's it, right now I'm I'm struggling quite a bit to try to figure out the numbers. Okay. Well, so it sounds like You've got a lot of inventory. You need to get that out generating revenue right now, correct? That is correct. Okay. So if we were sitting together in Charleston at a PPG meeting, we'd address your concern and we'd go around the room with people who've been through that and they'd provide feedback. So who has gone through this situation and found ways to close deals and move through revenue? Allie, you just raised your hand. So is that right? If I did, I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Right, no problem. <laughs> I need an auto, I need a magic unmuting tool somehow. Go ahead. So what have you done in the past to kick sales, kickstart sales up? I mean, in Philly, we use Google ads. We talk, you know, we would just open the funnel, if you will, just to remind people that we're here. Yeah, we, we started using those. We got a, we got a couple and then dried back up again. Um, you know, we just, just stepped up and started copying a lot of the works and the way you were doing yours um, because of your successes. And we had a lot of, and we did have some of those initial people you know, tell us that that's how they heard about it. Are you doing that yourself or are you using an outside company? We were using ad Okay, so have you stopped advertising them? Getting ready to. Hey, Monica, we're curious. Monica, we're curious if um, if, if Adplore has done much for you in the last few months. We, uh, the, well, the Google Ads in general, because yeah, we uh, we were we had some really great response up and through until maybe end of September, early October, and then nothing. And I know the market slowed down, but. Our six hundred dollars a month is not working for us right now. Doing Google Ads. Well, you know, we test. We're testing them right now, and I haven't noticed a particular, you know, no difference really in terms of the volume of inbound calls. But it is a little soon to tell. I think I've only got sixty, maybe ninety days with them, and I was going to let it run for a year and then compare. But I will say in the Philly market, you know, it's turned into a staging market. So we had good results. I mean, we had people the last week of December, we had three vacant stages the last week of December. Hmm. So uh, people are starting to get nervous about the product that they have listed in our market, and they just want to put the best foot forward. One of the things that we do to kind of get people who are listed, but it's vacant or who are listed, but they want us to go in and do a consult and maybe change some things is offer to pay for the photography to get it reshot. Sometimes that kind of pushes them into, okay, let's do it. Um, 
you know, we also offer the financing, you know, so that the bulk of the fee is due at the end. And that helps if the realtor's paying, which more and more often now the realtors are paying. Um, and then the other thing I think we do is just paying, we, I know Ali said, we've got five realtors who have given us over a half million dollars in business. That's not on a per year basis. That's over the lifetime of the realtor. We have about 40 realtors, between 40 and 50 realtors that are on our our annual list for, for holiday gifts. And that means they did multiple staging with us during the year. And so, you know, we, we will reach out to them and say, hey, what you got, what's going on, anything going on. Also, we've noticed that our investors are beginning to have projects that need to be staged. So we've heard from them recently. So I don't know, maybe our market's turning a little bit more than some of the other locations. I do want to, Matt, go ahead. I do want to add that um, Stephanie, our sales girl that does the sales in both locations, she does follow the new business development plan. You know, it's not like we're not trying to get out there and, and follow the brand. It's, um, it's just our market has shifted so drastically. And with 23 new competitors in the triad, it's, it's really... Um, it's really taken a toll on us because they offer their services for $1,500, like we talked about last month. Um, but it's, it's just, we're, we're starting to target a lot more builders. We're getting um, several more model homes with builders and we just move it from house to house. And that type of thing has been working fairly well in the triad. I mean, that's the one thing that's probably kept us going as long as it did through 2022. But as far as regular stagings, we just, I, I could tell a realtor, I'll pay you to let me do it. And the homeowners won't do it. They're like, we don't need it. Well, a couple of things, as far as the, the ad floor and just digital marketing, I mean, I think we need to remember this is the first week of January. I mean, we're planting seeds for the, the selling season. So I think we need to be a little patient as far as when the, you know, as far as when the leads are really going to pick up. Um, I know Monica and Allie, you guys, you've been doing online advertising for a while and that's been your biggest, one of your bigger sources of lead gen, correct? Correct. And it really is more about just getting the brand out there. Um, plus we have the truck, you know, it's, it's a lot. We're, we've got the truck, a lot of people recognize us in the market. Um, with that, we've got a van now that's branded. Um, one of the things, Nancy, that I tell the agents, and I know your market's way different than our market is, what I usually say when an agent brings up the possibility of another stager, I say, yikes, it's your brand. Do you really want to bring Sally Stager in here? These people are selling their million dollar house. Um, and usually realtors, like that's a big, you know, pivoting item for them because they know whoever they bring in is an extension of their brand um and and the, but, the big thing we, for us on that is that it's it's more about the homeowners losing their their margin you know the big sell dollars that they were selling for so now it's tightening back down and and they just neither one of them want to come off the money and the realtors are afraid because there are so many realtors that are so hungry and will cut their commissions, what's happening is they're afraid to approach the homeowners. So I say, let me talk to the homeowner and, and let's go that route. It, it's yeah. just, it's, it's a struggle right now. Yeah, no, I, I totally get that. And I'm not saying that it's easy for us either. I mean, we all have our, our, uh, our issues. Um, but I do think if Philly is, is, turning then maybe there's some optimism for people the other thing that we do in philadelphia that's a little bit different than some of the budgeting discussions and the um and planning is we we um evaluate this thing called a turn so inventory turn and you know we have inventory of between 20 and 30 homes in total and um if you can get an extra turn out of the year, you know, that's 20 times maybe two grand of profit. So you're getting an extra 40 grand of, I mean, it's money in your pocket. What is that? 80 grand of profit at the end of the year, which is how we ended up this year um, because we had four turns. And what I mean by that is 
we've got, you know, the 20 to 30 home stage right now in January, they will sell. That's an extra turn. So these will sell and I'll do another round in March and then those will sell. And then you've got May, June, and then those will sell. And then you've got this, the fall market starting August, September, and then those will sell. And so you're getting four turns of your inventory if you can place stuff now, as opposed to only getting three turns of your inventory if you just do spring, summer, and fall, if that makes sense to people. And Allie, if you guys didn't see, put in the, in the chat section that um, Philadelphia last year did 535K in revenue with only five realtors last year. And they've worked with others, but wanted everyone to know how important these relationships are. And so I think, Nancy, you indicated when we talked the other night that some of your realtors have aged out or something and they're retired. Yes. And so I think that three of our top five. Three of our top five have left. Yeah. Well, we have to find some new ones, I guess. But I mean, Lisa and Chris, how, how have you guys dealt with these kind of slowdowns in the past in San Diego? You guys still there? San Diego? Yeah, sorry. I was okay. trying to find the unmute button. Um, well, it was really tough this year, uh, primarily because... Um, you know, through COVID, we stayed healthy, uh, in, but we had to give raises to keep everybody going. Um, and so 2022 ended up being the year of overhead uh, because we didn't, you know, because things dropped off like a lead balloon in, you know, like September. So, uh, and same thing, you know, you kind of have to keep your good employees uh getting paychecks, uh, you know, so you don't lose them. And so it was just kind of a disappointing end of the year, uh, you know, because we ended up at a loss and well, we ended up at a, at a $40,000 loss, but we spent what 70,000 in furniture. So mm -hmm. because we expense isn't more than that. Oh, so 90. because we expense furnish furniture, then we, we show a loss instead of a profit. And again, that's different than most of you guys do it. But um, that's why this year we want to make sure that we're ready for this, you know, ready for the slow season. It was just an unusually slow, slow season. And so we're, we, we put our time into basically, you know, 2022's loss. Let's put our money into ramping up for 2023. So that's kind of how we had to look at it. But you, I mean, you've talked a lot about this VA giving you more time to sell. Is that not... That, that will definitely be the case for this coming year. Um, so yeah, definitely. Uh, and then and then having the other two salespeople is gonna free us up to do the more important relationship building in the high end. So for Chris and I, um, but it's really freed up a lot of Chris's time. He did a lot more sales in, Q, in Q4 than he's ever done because the VA is doing all the contracts and you know, helping us on the, Invoice. on the backside, all the invoicing and, mm -hmm. and, and working with the accountant, uh, you know, and bookkeepers and things like that on the back end of QuickBooks. So yeah, it's, it's been a really good investment. So Lynn Chapman, you've been around a, a while as have I. So what, when someone is at a uh, frustrating stopping point, they want to revive their sales. What's I know you're going to say the marketing checklist, but what's your advice typically for people? You're muted, muted. You're muted. Okay, sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Um, just the same old back to basics. You know, we got to analyze where where our marketing dollars are going, staffing's in place, um, and that business development checklist and just back to basics and get the phones ringing again over and over. Matt, if I could chip in on Robbie's question there. Um, one thing we've, you know, th this time of year, like we, we kind of anticipate going into 
you know, late November and December, the warehouse is going to be, you know, fully packed. But it, but that's okay because like what's happening right now is like we're doing, we've got a really busy schedule through January, so it's going to empty out pretty quick. But if it's an issue, one thing that we've had success with is calling our favorite realtor, like when we have a D stage coming up, say in October, <clears throat> we'll call our favorite realtors and say, look, we, if you're willing, if you've got a house, you know, we'll send them photos of the house we're getting ready to D stage and say, hey, this stuff is coming available. We'll give you a great deal. You know, we'll, we'll move it into uh, a listing you have say, you know, just give them a good deal on that. And because we're talking to our realtors that, uh, you know, bring us a lot of business and say, if you can use this exact furniture where we can use it, you know, take it straight from the house it is to your new house, we'll, um, you know, we basically shave off the cost of a move, right? So we can give them a, a good break on that. And the other one too, is to start offering, one thing we normally only offer to our realtors is a deferred payment plan where it can, we ask for the down payment, but they don't have to pay the balance for some period of months. And we'll, we'll offer that to others, or we extend the uh, initial deployment period a little bit for people to, if it puts them over the top. But, you know, we, we deal with that every year where the warehouse is just as full as it can be at the end of the year. And at sometimes we've even had to, to rent additional space, but it always clears out within 30 to 60 days. <clears throat> awesome. Well, hopefully that happens for you guys in uh, North Carolina. Okay. Um, I want to make sure we got a couple of other people to get to. So Lorraine Pearson, Lorraine, you want to unmute and Oh, Lorraine, <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. Hey, you want to unmute? There you go. Hey, I'm sorry. Could you repeat? Hey, Lorraine, good uh, happy good new year. So new. yeah, we're going through your goals for the year and then your plans and action steps, you, you know, just to get there. So no. What's going on in Raleigh? And uh, well, you know, we've started. Uh, I've I've got a marketing girl now that's working on my social media and all more since we were not as active as we could have been, and um, you know, reaching out with my realtors. I do have a couple older realtors. I have empathy for Nancy because I know I've got two of my big realtors that'll probably be fading out in the next year or two. But you know, it's uh, this. You know, in our business, it's really hard to tell which way the market's, you know, going. I mean, it's either gangbusters or we're trying to figure out a new strategy on how to make money. Because, uh, you know, like Lisa said, September, everything dropped off the cliff. We were lucky we have, you know, business going. But I mean, last month, nothing. And this month, it's slow. I'm usually busy by now. I mean, I have a few things on the books coming up, but... Not enough, you know, when you got a warehouse, you got people to pay. I mean, you got to be making a lot of money to keep everything going. So it's uh, it's disappointing right now. What am I going to do? I'm, uh, you know, the realtors are all scared of the home manager program because they think that they're going to sell. And the people, you know, a lot of the ones that I've got, I could do home managers with, they've already paid for staging and, you know, I've approached a couple of them, but, you know, and then it's hard. I always like to have a home manager home to move somebody to. So um, I think, I think we're a little ways. I'm, I'm thinking if it keeps going like it is, maybe by the summer, we might be able to retouch the home manager program, which is a favorite of the Pearsons. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So hopefully, you know, that'll work out. But yeah, it's just hard times. We're going to make it through it. We're just tightening our belt straps and um, just going to keep plugging along and trying to get so, ourselves out there. I will tell you, just from, from many years being here, when I've seen a slowdown, um, I see pent up demand and then all of a sudden it explodes and you're busy. Right. You can't keep up with all the leads. So I would say, you know, if anything during the slowdown, take advantage of that and, right. you know, put be the ready. Button. 
Yeah, well, yeah, get ready for sure. Pick I hope so, too. and I hope everybody has a good year. I'm just hoping this is just a slow start to a great year for everybody. Yeah, and you know, I would. I think once the public gets over the the whole shock that okay, you know, interest rates and you don't get as much for your money and blah blah blah. Once they get over that and the Feds calm down with all that stuff, maybe that'll help some. I don't know. Our worst our worst market is five hundred. Uh, Nine hundred thousand, you know, and that's what most people are having to buy now. And I, I, I don't know. I just people aren't buying right now. So we'll see what happens. But well, um, I, I don't know if that helps anybody with the information. But that's what's no, going on I, here in our part of Raleigh. No, I think, and, I think sharing that because I think when people hear that you know others are going through what they're going, I think it helps. Yeah, yeah, so, and and it'll come back. I mean, I I'm just I'm just hoping sooner than later. And for everybody, every market's different, but I think across the board, everybody's got to sell their houses. People are moving. It's something that's like you got to get a haircut, your fingernails done. I mean, it's one of those services that you know everybody needs and staging definitely works and i know most we've now gotten most of the realtors are on board knowing that it's just trying to find realtors that can sell it for you you know because they don't want to you know they're the gatekeepers so um anyways but uh happy new year's everybody yeah you too so um dr g sylvia in atlanta she had the consultation had to run but she's hiring a salesperson and plugging along so that's that's awesome and really you know it's um definitely day at a time doing all the basic blocking and tackling um getting you know and i would you know put your budgets together put a marketing plan together i would continue to do your digital marketing um and you may also want to clear, you know, while you have the time, maybe you clear out some of the old stuff in your warehouse and have a warehouse sale or give it away or make room, all that stuff. Uh, you know, look at the stuff that hasn't sold that you haven't used in a year <laughs> that uh, now is the time to do it and make some room. You know, I'd like to jump in and say something about the fan club that we've mentioned a few times, those five realtors that brought a half a million dollars in sales and realtors that are retiring you know we used to call it our fan club i'd like for us to do that again what if you had five more like that so maybe putting a focus on those relationships and you know they only happen face to face and while all the other digital stuff is great in our marketing you know we we have to do that but maybe a focus on a little more networking or a little more open houses or visiting their offices those face to face that really um you know they they solidify those uh relationships that bring us one person bringing us a hundred thousand dollars in in business every year and try to increase that fan club you know when we start out in training i say you need 10 people in your fan club when you've got 10 realtors in your fan club then you are really hopping and so maybe we need to put a little focus back on getting that fan club built up you know, lunches, I mean, you know, just happy hours, all that kind of stuff uh, definitely can help. So um, I've got another poll to ask you guys. So which additional services do you want to focus on in 2023? So why don't we kind of look at that for a second and take a minute or so to vote. Are you guys seeing that? There you go. Okay. All right. We'll share the results. So, interior design has the biggest 
number, but we also see updates, short-term rental, restyle, someone e-design. So, um, so who's doing home short-term rentals right now? Because we get questions on that quite a bit. You are, Pratt? So how did, what's a typical ER job too. look like for a Airbnb or something? Um, we've had one, we've had at least one project like that continually on the go for since late 2021. And um, basically we just set it up as, uh, uh, or I, I build a proposal as simply as possible to, I have, I charge them a service fee and I charge them a, a purchasing fee. So we'll go out, we'll do the design, buy all the stuff for them and then assemble it, you know, take delivery of it, set it up and assemble it and put it into their house. The jobs usually take about two to three months from the time we start till the time we finish. And I have them pay me, uh, you know, a significant down payment on the purchasing stuff and a 50% down payment on the services. And then uh, the services are generally a percentage of the total purchase price. And then we just, you know, it, uh, we just get the job, you know, Shelly orders everything when it's all in. We either take it all over to the house in boxes or, or assemble it in the warehouse and then deliver it just like a vacant staging job and uh, works out pretty nice. And it's, it's a nice way too, that sometimes we, if we've got inventory that is not making money for us, we'll just sell it to them at a discount and include it in their short-term rental property. So it's a way to kind of keep our revenue fresh too. Okay. But uh uh, no, those, those have worked out fine, and we have enough of them now that we can kind of track and know how much time Shelly is spending on the job so that we know, you know, there's direct costs related to it for the assembly and delivery and setup, of course, but we look at overhead on those kind of projects as Shelly's time and uh, make sure that we're charging appropriately that we're getting paid for that time with a profit, so... Okay, so it sounds like you've uh, found a way to leverage that that um, model. So that's awesome. So Catherine Chandler, did you also mention short-term rental? Yeah, um, <laughs> we're struggling a little bit, and so I'm I'm reconfiguring. But um, yeah, I've written, I think, eleven proposals for short-term rentals, uh, furnishing jobs. Um, in 2022, this past year, and we did two. Um, okay. The flip side on staging, I mean, we have like a 90% close rate. So we have an issue. Um, so I'm working with the um, the guy that runs the iTrip franchise in my area. Uh, he's, the, he's where I've sourced 10 of those 11 proposals. And um, coming up with some other options and some different ways of doing it. And I'm actually going to leverage the e-design thing for short-term rentals. So I'm creating, um, and, and the reason we're not getting it is price. Um, and I'm not going to, I'm not gonna um, try and compete on price. I won't do it on staging. I'm not gonna do it on uh, short-term rentals. So um, they don't understand the value that we offer because we're not big in that market yet locally, um, like staging, so or unlike staging. So I'm coming up with a super value um, option to get in. And then once they start to know who we are, um, I mean, most short-term rental owners own multiple properties. So if I can get in, and get them to appreciate what we do, then I'm hoping I can help them redo and restyle all their other properties or help them with new ones and things like that. So we have a whole plan. It's it's going to be, um, my goal is that it's a, it's a pretty large percentage of our business for 2023 um, and a profitable one as well. Okay. So. Awesome. Yeah, the trick is- how, are, them, you, how it, are you guys getting your leads for that? 
So Monica, almost all of mine, with the exception of one, uh, and I, I found, well, actually, <laughs> almost all of them have come from management companies that manage short-term rentals. So 10 of them came from this iTrip, which is a person that I met actually through BNI about three years ago. Um, he owns the largest iTrip franchise in the country here in Portland. And um, so he sends me every all the new jobs. Uh, so sometimes they're consultations, sometimes they're furnishing. And then um, the other one I got was a person who does short-term rental management. And I met her at a networking event. She's like, oh my God, I have a client that needs you. Um, that was one of the ones we did. So we've done two, but we, I haven't been able to, all the empty ones <laughs> where it requires buying furniture, I can't get people to pull the trigger on it. Uh, so I'm working on it. Yeah, the trick uh, for for the furniture, like mo almost all of our clients, I'm thinking back, actually all of them are the actual owners of the short-term rental property. And right. um, if they uh, own other short-term rental properties, they understand how much it costs to furnish a home so they don't balk too much when you give them a big number for purchase price. Um, but, you know, and, and the first one we ever did was a lady that had four other short term rental properties, but we staged her personal home for her to sell. And she asked, do you do short term rental? And we said, well, we sure can. Hadn't done one then, but she, you know, we kind of told her what we'd buy the furnishings and then here's how much we charge. And she goes, oh, yeah, that's definitely worth it because I'm doing it myself now. And that was our first in. And ever since that's what we've done. And the best ones are the guys that are just in it as an investment. You know, they bought a house, they want to make a short-term rental. And so they've done their homework for what it's going to cost them. And apparently yeah, right. what we're offering is in their ballpark there. So, And to be clear, in every case, the proposal has been with the homeowner as well, or the property mm -hmm. owner, not the, not the guy that referred me. Uh, but yeah. um, I have a problem with two other... One's a former stager and the other is an existing stager that undercuts us. Mm. And they undercut us on staging and I don't, it's the markets figured it that out and people will go to them for cheap and they go to us for the nicer stuff, which I'm fine with. But on the short-term rental market, it's, <laughs> I'm having a hard yeah. time selling my value and I don't have any, you know, examples. I only have two and both of those were restyle stock type <clears throat> rental properties so we'll get there so by the way I, I just pulled up iTrip that does they do short-term rental management and so they're not in all of our locations but they're in Dallas Houston San Diego I mean they're all over the country so you may want to uh, look up it's ITRIP but just you know maybe I'll just google uh, Airbnb hosts because uh, some of these guys have literally hundreds of units that they that they manage. So yeah, like yeah, that, it's you know, huge. So I wanted to have Barbara Bliss. You, you're still there, correct? Blissville, as we call you. Yes, I am. Okay, so I've heard a lot on this call, you know, about different ways to market, and but also, you know, I've heard the phone's not ringing or we're not getting inquiries, etc. But if you look at this initial slide I, I shared, the, the most effective is your direct contact. Um, you know, networking is, is great. But when I started here years ago, we talked a lot about dialing for dollars. So, Barbara, I think you've done a lot of that in your career. That's show homes, correct? Just banging the phones? Yeah. Yep. That's the only way we can get more business is um, we send out emails. We still do that marketing checklist. Basically, we look at the vacants every single day and we identify them or the restyles and then we send them an email and then we pick up the phone. And literally, if you don't just sit there on the phone um, every single week, uh, you're not gonna, we, we don't get business. So <laughs> it's just a matter of literally reaching out to them and um, they're so happy that we contacted them. And um, I really love this call though. I love what you guys are all doing now. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's inspiring. <laughs> I've been a one trick pony for so long, this home manager, and it was so good for so long. And then COVID. So we were trying to catch up and just 
so many houses came in for so you know 2021 it was uh 2022 was the worst because we were basically regrouping um and so my goal is to we're revamp re-ramping up now um and i want to my goal would be 400,000 um we had a really bad 2022 um but just um i signed two houses in december for home managers and um, I'm still doing home manager product. I mean, there's people that are like, oh, we're not putting our house on until February. So glad you, you're you going to stage it because then we don't have to deal with the snow removal and the, and the utilities. And so um, I've, I've reduced our overhead. Um, talk about, you know, getting rid of some of the old stuff. We gave away a lot to the veterans and to the to the um charitable organization, some of the old stuff that I just don't even use anymore. So we use some of that downtime to, we, we cleared out our warehouse big time and then we cherry picked all our good stuff. Because when you've been doing this business for 18 years, you're going to end up with a lot of stuff that you don't use. So I think it's great if you keep getting rid of stuff along the way. I had not been really doing that. We've been going at such a high velocity for so long. So um, we're really excited about 2023 because it's a new beginning for us. Um, we're going to continue to do the home manager product for sure because it's been it's still profitable here, and I'd love to to be able to see more of us do that because it does carry me through that that money does carry us through those hard months that are slower, you know. And having right now, I still have five home managers. I mean, I was at an all time high prior to COVID. We were peaking at 19 home managers and then pretty much on average 15 home managers. And I don't think it's a thing of the past. I think it's gonna come back. I definitely see the change coming right now already where realtors are like, oh my gosh, thank God. You know, they didn't need me in 2022 as much as they're starting to think they need me now um, because houses are still sitting, um, they're not, I mean, there's certain houses that you can identify for having a home manager. Um, I don't know if I'm really up to re, you know, directing this franchise. I'm looking to sell it, but at the same time, just trying to keep my revenues up and keeping my overhead down. So Barbara, if I'm a customer, treat this, if we're, I'm, I'm in, you know, Lake Forest and I've got a $2 million house been empty for a year sell me why tell me why and, and why don't you sell me on the home manager program well they're really not empty for a year anymore um well, I'm, but, just saying, I'm, I'm just act like i was yeah you know, or, or three months whatever just sell me and why should you have a stranger live in my house well the thing the best it's the same thing it's it's um nothing new it's just one flat fee that's paid at closing and we pick up utilities and manage and maintain the house till it sells and it's whole house staging. And so, you know, it, it still resonates with, with sellers and they sign up like right away. They're like, oh my God, this is the best thing in the world. I, I don't think that it's a thing of the past. I still think that it's something that not everybody's gonna do it though, for sure. But so for you guys who've tried to pitch this and were turned down, what were your top reasons? for it what are they telling you the home sell too fast they don't want someone living in it what are, what are the reasons they don't like it in my case it's almost always well my home's going to sell so quickly i don't want to get involved with this and and i get that from the realtors oh actually a big one i've gotten from a couple of realtors is that they don't want me to pitch it because they feel like it's this is what you do when you can't sell a house and they're admitting defeat and I, I don't know how they got that and I don't know how to break that, but that's actually very common amongst the luxury <laughs> realtors here that the, the yeah. old school ones. I got well, the same as Catherine. I got the same as Catherine. The most expensive luxury, luxury realtors told me that. What are you trying to say that I'm not going to sell? That so what you, what's happened. your response, Blissville, to that one? I mean, the, the main thing is the price that what it costs this one flat fee at, at closing. And I would say to you, don't let those get you down because definitely I've had to 
work a lot harder to get these houses in the system because I'll definitely get those same responses, but they're, you know, what are they going to do to sell that house? You know, so, you know, when there's one that is going to, they're, they're open to it. You know, of course there's going to be some that aren't, but don't, I'd say that if I, I mean, I used to have maybe a hundred houses that would be vacant. Now it's probably 50, you know, and of those I'll probably get two, um, you know, where in the past it was a lot easier. So of course I'm going to have the door closed on me, but then of course I'm Barbara Bliss. I'm going to keep going because, you know, I know this product is the most amazing product um, that you can't beat it because what I really sell is that it's one flat fee that's paid at closing. They love that. It's a half a point. And actually I have um, had to do some, you know, like when I say dialing for dollars, I'll do the flash sale. I'll, you know, it used to be three quarters of a point and it drops to a half point. I might give them 20% off that first three quarters. If it sells in the first four months, um, they love it. And, and I, talk about the agents that you have relationships with they they will continue once they've tried it they'll keep sending you so the, bar, the five you have right now what are they paying monthly what's the range about 1800 okay so yeah just matt just to just to add on um to what uh, barbara was saying I, I think it's a great uh year for home manager uh business and I think to help sell it is, um, you know, you have to, you have to, you have to talk to the homeowner if at all possible, uh, and you show them that, you know, especially with these big houses that take a lot of furniture, their monthly fee if we're just staging is, is, um, you know, can be, you know, two thousand, three thousand dollars a month uh, versus no payment with the home manager, and they can defer the cost to close of escrow. Those are the huge two benefits that a seller gets, not to mention the house is always in, in, in great shape for um, uh, showings and open houses. It's clean and neat and all the other benefits you have. But if you show them the amount of money they can save if the home's on the market now for three, four, five, six months, uh, it, it can add up. And that's a real benefit. I would say that's the biggest thing uh, what Chris just said is I really try to get to the homeowner and if I don't get that uh, realtor enrolled in the product, she was like, oh, yeah, I'll just pass. I'll, I'll, I'll tell them about it. I'm like, please don't send it to them until you call me. And let's, let's really, I want you to be excited before you send it to your seller. So it really is kind of digging into getting that realtor excited. Because once you do get to the homeowner and they find out, if you can get the realtor to be enrolled in what you're doing and what, what you know, and, and obviously my track record, I'll just pull up my list of um, the realtors that we've worked with in the past and say, hey, you know, you should talk to Mike Thomas in your office. And that's really important to the build that relationship. So that person that you've never worked with before. Oh, yeah, I know you. I've seen your work, but they've never worked with us before. And then it's such an it's such a unique business model. And I mean, these are long conversations that I have with these people, but once I have, you know, I, once I have them in my back pocket, they're, they start trusting and, and they, they're so happy, you know, and, and then, and then you, they give you another one and then they give you another one. I had literally, I think five houses with this one realtor last year, past year and a half, five or six houses. And she just keeps feeding me more and more now. So, you know, we started the call talking about telling stories and using data to show the ROI. And so I think Barbara's uh, does a really good job in doing that. And I mean, just if you just do the math, <laughs> she's got five at 1800 a piece. I mean, if, uh, you know, if you could have 10, bringing in 20 to 25,000 a month, I mean, how, how would that impact your profitability right now. I mean, that would be. Well, don't get me wrong. This is my lowest in 18 years I've ever had. This is my lowest year. So this has not been an easy 2022. I'm glad that year is over. Yeah. And, um, but I want to be back at 10. I want to be back at 15. Right. That's awesome. All right. Well, good.
Good feedback. Um, thank you, Barbara, for sharing all that. And then, you know, the I think the the dialing for dollars, you know, using your MLS, we talk about mining for gold and, you know, that, that's, yeah, we, we've talked about the virtual assistants, maybe scheduling and trying to schedule meetings for you and giving them a list of people. So, I mean, that might be something else to consider. So we're almost done. I mean, these calls seem to fly. There's a lot of great info. Anyone else have any feedback or questions before we all break? I think everyone's getting ready for lunch. Or... I do have one um, thing I just signed up for that was kind of interesting, and we'll see where it goes. But I don't know how many of you have heard of Zoom Casa, mm -hmm. but they kind of do the update thing. Um, it's a little bit of an overlap with something like um, Curbio, where they manage the project and update people to get their houses to sell. They'll also work with people if they're staying in their houses. And I reached out to them because they also will um, finance staging. So if I have a home where somebody, you know, they want to stage it, but they don't want to pay right away. I can connect them to Zoom Casa. They have some very specific requirements and that they, and one of them is because they really don't want to work with investors. They want to work with homeowners, but um, they'll pay me. I, you know, I get paid right away. The homeowner pays at closing, um, you know, similar to some of the other fees that we had done in the past, but it's, it looks very, very simple. And then in addition to that, once you're an approved vendor with them, not only can I send them my clients that want to not pay right away, but if they have any clients in the area that are selling and they need a stager at the moment, I'm the only stager approved in Portland. So they'll send me staging jobs. Um, and I, you know, so it was pretty simple to get approved. Um, and we'll see. I literally just got my approval the week after Christmas. So I have no idea what this is going to be for well, us, but. Well, I'll send that out in the, the next new, newsletter. It's Zoom, G-O-O-M, CASA, C-A-S-A. -S -A. And did you, do you have a specific contact there now? Catherine? Um, I can look. Yeah, I'm sure I do. Okay. I don't know. You did, let me know. So instead of recreating the wheel. I think my yeah, guy they're, be they're based out of California. Fred, yeah. uh, I can't think of his last name right now. He's the owner of it. But we had a real busy year with them about two or three years ago. We did a number of houses and everything Catherine just described works. But I think their I think their Houston group kind of fell apart a little bit. It depends a lot on their ability to have a good marketer locally that can get jobs, right? Yeah. So all right. Well, thank you for sharing. So, all right, guys, we'll have a good rest of the week and uh, we will talk soon. All right. Thanks for the time. Thanks, guys. See you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>